We're going to begin the afternoon program with a double act. Two speakers for the price of one. And we're delighted to have Nina Basic and Henry Solman uh, as our guest speakers. Nina has been professor and program leader of urban horticulture of the Urban Horticulture Institute at Cornell University for the past 35 years. She is co-author of Trees in the Urban Landscape. I'm sure all my ex-students are familiar with that uh, particular volume. A text on establishing trees in disturbed and urban landscapes. In addition, Dr. Basak has authored over 100 papers on the physiological problems of plants growing in urban environments, including improved plant selections for difficult sites, soil modification, including the development of the CU structural soil, and improved transplanting technology. She works closely with municipalities to help implement best practices in urban forest management. Dr. Henrik Soman is a lecturer and researcher at the Swedish University of Agricultural Sciences in Olnarp. His research focus is on tree selection for urban environments and their unique demands. In his work, he has traveled around the world to collect and study plants for urban environments. For the moment, Henrik has a postdoctorate position at Cornell University in the States, and together with Nina Bassett, the research focuses on tree selection for different ecosystem services in urban environments. In November, Henrik will begin his position with Gothenburg Botanic Garden in Sweden as its scientific curator, where his plant geek personality can further flourish. It gives me great pleasure to introduce Nina Basic, followed by Dr. Henrik Soma. Oh, thank you very much. I, I don't know whether to be penalized or honored to have the after lunch slot, but I will keep it lively, and so we'll all stay awake and uh, go on for the rest of the afternoon. Um, I'd like to thank, of course, Keith and Bartram Trees for this wonderful opportunity to participate in this fantastic conference I've enjoyed all morning, and hopefully we'll have a great afternoon to finish up. Um, so, I work at Cornell University uh, in New York State, and uh, my job for the last 30 odd years has been looking at the problems of planting trees in, urban, in, in the urban environment. Um, and I've chosen to really focus my area of research on plant establishment. And that whole process of plant establishment is from where you think I should plant a tree to where it's in the ground for a few years. That's the process of plant establishment. My idea is that if you do things right at the beginning, you have many fewer problems later on. You'll get actually the, the reason why you plant the trees, the ecosystem services and so on, will actually be realized as opposed to just a feel good experience of planting the tree. So, um, what I'm gonna be talking about today, in fact, um, is this process in, uh, and how plant selection fits in with this. And then Henrik will probably take us home with uh, his take on the same subject area. So we work together, and I think it will be an interesting uh, afternoon for both of, for all of you. By the way, this is uh, something I've seen a lot here at Bartram. This is uh, Acer Freemanii Autumn Blaze, which is a very popular tree, both in the States and I guess now becoming so here. Uh, a great hybrid, naturally occurring hybrid. So anyway, just to tell you what that is. So urban trees and tree selection fits into a myriad of different types of environmental sites. Urban trees don't, are not planted in one type of site. And street trees and the urban, inner city trees, the ones that I really work on, uh, have a, a diversity of, of sites that really can't be generalized. So we see uh, urban trees in very difficult types of sites, from small towns in New York City here, um, and also pretty bucolic areas where we have kind of nicer areas for trees to be planted. So lots of different sites, lots of different conditions. And sometimes it's really odd to think that here you have two little leaf lindens planted 20 feet apart, and the same cultivar even, planted the same way, yet one is doing really well, one is doing really poorly. 
what's going on here. So the understanding of the site really is the key aspect before we can get to plant selection. So this is that process I talk about, and it, it really applies to trees, plants, anything that you're going to be planting. You have to understand your site first. You have to understand what's going on there in terms of the resources that plants can get or not get. Is it limiting or is it lots of resources? And then you can make your best plant selection for those site conditions. However, and this is what we call the right plant in the right place, been done to death. However, there's many times where the site is just so limiting that there's no tree, at least, species that will do well in that condition. And so you need to do, look at the idea of site modification. How can we modify the site so that we're going to get the best choice of plant selection, best tree selection? And I think this is a key part that many people don't realize, and so that site and the site conditions play a very important role in the success of plant selection. And then finally, transplanting techniques, getting good quality plant material into the ground the right way, the first years of aftercare are, are critical. And this whole process is the landscape establishment or tree establishment process. So we're going to focus on plant selection, but it really isn't possible to do this without understanding this and a little bit of this. And so um, one of the things that Henrik and I talked about when we were thinking about this talk is that I would be talking about more, we're going to talk about two types of plant strategies, a plant that is an avoider of stress, a plant that avoids stress, and a plant that tolerates stress. And we'll talk a bit more about what that means. And uh, I'm going to be speaking more of the avoider side of things. Okay. So there are four key aspects of plant selection. And it's really worthwhile to take a little time to consider this before we jump to buy a certain tree because we've seen it work well in the past. It's really, we'll talk about why that's important to really think about the species and to not go with what's always been done before for many reasons. So first of all, plant has to be adapted to site conditions. This is like the hierarchical thing. If, it, if the plant doesn't make it based on site limitations, anything else, you know, any kind of ecosystem services will not be uh, realized. So we really need to think about adapted to site conditions. And the tree needs to meet the design of functional objectives for why you plant the tree. What's going on? Why do you want to do it? What are, what's going on in terms of that aspect? And it has to manage match management limitations. Sometimes we think of things uh, which need a lot of extra management help to make them uh, do well, or their limitations in how they transplant, or disease issues, and so on. It has to match the management limitations for that area. And then finally, aesthetics. It's probably why we got into this area. We just like trees. We like what they make us feel like. We like to look at them. Uh, their beauty and so on just uh, is important. And so we need to think about that as well. But these are the four basic areas of, of plant selection. And so we have trees that have a genetic potential. All living things have a genetic potential. Here's a London plane tree in an enormous a London plane tree in a great site showing its true genetic potential. Here's the same basic genetic material on a street in a very busy downtown street of Manhattan, New York City, and it's, there's a difference in growth there. And I can see it's really what's happening is the environmental reality is uh, pushing up against that genetic potential and you get the gen genetic, the site really determines how well that tree is going to do. So we try to match up the genetic potential, the site conditions to get the best results. So let's talk a little bit about adaptability to site because there are things that I've thought about for the last 30 odd years that I think are really uh, key to, because there are a lot of things you can think about, but there's a few things that are really key to making sure you have those things down. One of them is, uh, basically, is it going to make it through the winter and summer? So heat or cold tolerance, these are issues that are kind of pretty basic. And where I live in, uh, in upstate New York, uh, winter is a big feature for us. So we can't, you know, although global warming is inevitably happening, it's not happening that fast, so that we had one of the hardest winters, the coldest winters on record this past winter. So yes, things are changing, but not going to be changing by next week. Uh, space, above and below ground. What have you got above ground? What's the 
the envelope that you can fill above ground, and what have you got below ground in terms of rooting space? These are key aspects of understanding how you can fill those areas. Sun and shade and microclimates are key. We've heard about earlier the urban heat island. Well, that's a general idea of it's warmer in the cities than in the surrounding rural uh, countryside. But if you get to the micro site, what's happening on this street, you can see tremendously varied differences in uh, heat. Wet or dry soil conditions, this is really key in terms of even we look at ecologically where trees tend to uh, do well is it basically in, in terms of their hydro hydrologic conditions in the soil, whether it's well-drained, swampy, wet, very dry. Trees kind of sort themselves out in this wet to dry gradient. And we need to understand that in a built or disturbed environment as well. And then there's soil pH, salts, nutrients. These are lesser but important issues that we need to consider um, when we're talking about the nutrition of the trees. So site assessment, understanding site opportunities and limitations. You know, how do you go from this, which is, this happened to be a, a site in, um, in Ithaca, New York, where I live, where after building development got through with making a whole new housing development, they gave this little parcel uh, of this, the staging area for the building to the city and saying, here, you can make a park on this. So uh, yeah, we could clean it off. We could make it look you know, neat. But what happened to the soil in the process of construction was really the key that we had to understand before we could make anything. But we could make it go from this to this, which is the same site a few years later. Lots of different techniques, not just plant selection. A lot of different techniques to make this happen. So. This is the key. Heat and cold, I'd show you New York State, not because it's important, but just to show you that this is the winter, the lowest winter temperatures for New York State. We go from, I think, that I call it the tundra up in the Adirondack Mountains where we have oh, centigrade, minus 40 centigrade winter temperatures, uh, to I call it the tropics of New York City down here, which is Oh, zero. Uh, so very, very varied winter temp conditions. And we, we know where we are in terms of the big picture. And I'm sure you, wherever you are from, you know the big picture of what you can expect in the winter and the summer. But the, that's the first step. But then we want to look at the microclimate. What's happening right around our, our plant? Where are we going to be planting our trees? And I have a, a really neat picture. Well, by the way, this just shows you by reflected heat can raise the temperatures tremendously in a, in a site, and that's why we have the urban heat island on a larger scale. But I, I'd like to show you this picture, which it was taken with an infrared camera, a camera that measures the heat of the surfaces. And so I apologize for, for Fahrenheit here, but uh, it's about uh, 40 degrees uh, and about, what, 27, 28 degrees and about 18 it's my quick and dirty centigrade to Fahrenheit conversion. So this is a key telling the temperature of the site. And what are we looking at here? Have a look. We're actually looking at a park, OK? So here are your trees, OK? And this big blue blob here, what do you think that is? That's shade of the tree. So we're about, you know, here we're at 17, 18 degrees uh, under, in the shade. And this area here, this green area here, what's that? Grass. It's grass, right. It's a grass, it's a park, it's grass in the sun. And we're here, you know, above like 27 degrees or so, 82 degrees Fahrenheit. And what do you think this is? What do you think that orange thing is? It's a sidewalk, it's asphalt. And here we are at about 40 degrees C, 105 degrees, in a sunny day in a park. So the microsites can be extraordinarily different, 20 degrees or more difference in a very microsite. And so when we're planting trees in these you know, built surfaces, paved surfaces, we have a much higher incidence of radiant heat to drive the process of water loss from these trees, which can result in a lot of stress. So I argue that, in fact, we've been seeing climate change in urban areas way before the idea of climate change became an, uh, an international issue. 
Climate change in cities has been there for many, many years. And we've had to deal with this, or we should be doing this. So we have spatial differences as well, spatial issues. Uh, I don't see too many overhead utilities here, but boy, it's a big thing for us. And talk about planting the wrong tree in the wrong space. Um, you know, we don't have a lot of these kind of donut hole trees are not what we expect when we plant a tree. But soil is really the key. Soil is, you know, where most of our issues are good and bad come from in terms of site. And this is the good stuff. This is where you see the nice clumps and spaces. You can get water holding and water drainage, and you get air, and it's just like the Goldilocks of not too cold, not too hot, not too wet, not too dry. Uh, and this makes, uh, really is great for plants. And we all know this as plants people. We know when we see the good stuff. Uh, this is not the good stuff. We have a lot of rubble and buried junk, called it anthropaic, which just means human junk, uh, buried on sites, especially where you have a history of human habitation. Much cheaper to bury it than to cart it away. Uh, so we get a lot of stuff. It's archaeology when we start digging in some of these areas. Or just building rubble, as you see here, which changes not only this is not really good soil to plant in, but it changes the, the acidity and alkalinity of the site, changes the nutrient availability. We can have a very different nutrient availability based on a lot of high calcium containing, uh, calcium carbonate containing materials. So this can give rise to nutrient deficiency, as you see here, a lack of iron, iron chlorosis, not because there's no iron in the soil, but just the pH is too high, and these oaks cannot take it up when its pH is so high. So we need to understand about the soil, soil pH. And we have issues of construction, development. What happens to the soil after you've got this construction site. I also love the protection around the tree here. You know, these little snow fences, and I don't know who they're for. They're definitely not helping the tree any. Um, but a lot of construction happens, and in the process, soil degradation. And this is what, you know, we saw the good stuff. This is the bad stuff. This is the stuff that's so compacted, so dense, that it, tree roots cannot penetrate it. And if tree roots cannot penetrate this, it soil might as well not be there, okay? Because you're dealing with a much more restricted soil volume. And when you have dense penetrated, uh, dense compacted soil like this, you have other, it's a kind of myriad of, or domino effect of other effects that, ca that happen. One is the poor drainage. When you have all those pores crushed together in compaction, you're not gonna get drainage in any appreciable way and you get a wet condition, a very wet. In fact, many people who say, oh, this tree is, is you, know, uh, you know, can deal with compaction, can tolerate compaction, what they're really saying is it can deal with poor drainage because no tree can deal with that dense soil that roots cannot penetrate. So that's a, and also when you have no drainage, you have no oxygen, so root respiration suffers, no oxygen in the root zone, you have microorganisms that die, I mean it's a, a myriad effect, and the nutrients are not available, so compaction causes a, a domino effect of bad things that happen to trees. And this is ubiquitous, wherever there has been development, construction, and the aftermath of that. So here I show you just, uh, we're looking down on the Ag Quad at Cornell University. Here's where my office is in this building here. And this is the, the Great Man Library, the Agricultural Library, that was uh, one of the best in the country. But it was basically re revamped, it was gutted, and the whole inside was done. And this took over three years. And the Ag Quad, where, uh, which we think of a nice green space in an, in an academic institution, was a, a building site for three and a half years. There were trailers and coins, all kinds of stuff there, basically working on this library. And so after the library was done, they were taking out, and this is what it looked like in the front. It was just a, still a building site. And the campus said, you know, to me and my class, we always do projects on campus, just, why don't you make this into a garden? And why don't you just you know, make this really nice again? Because it was nice, but or it was at least passable. And now it's 
had so much impact that we really had to think about, before we could think about plant selection, we had to think about making the soil viable. So this is a really important aspect we deal with. And for the 14, 15 years now, we've done projects where we remediated compacted soil and had long-term effects uh, of increasing that, the beneficial effects of the soil. So this is what we call one of our processes, which is getting to the, I'm getting to plant selection, which is about making the soil usable so plants can actually grow. And we call this a scoop and dump. Okay, this is not exactly high tech. Basically, we, put, we get a very compacted soil, which we cannot hardly dig into. We spread about uh, 12 inches, 12 centimeters of uh, compost on top of that, well compost, about 12 centimeters, spread it on top, and then with a bucket like this, go down, oh, 24 to 30 centimeters down, scoop it up and dump it, scoop it up and dump it. So the compost is getting incorporated in, in, in an irregular way, like veins of usable soil in a very compacted mess. And we do this over the whole site, and then we plant and we mulch. In fact, we, we get pretty good results. That's that same site the year we planted it, that same site in front of the library. And uh, a couple of years later, Things are really growing well. They're knitting together. We get closed canopies. We do, basically the plants are doing great. And we thought, well, this is a useful thing, but how can we keep that level of organic matter in the soil to reduce the density? And so what we do every year is we mulch with a shredded bark mulch, which we'd hope to replenish the organic matter. And we found after 15 years of study that by increasing the microorganisms in the soil, they're actually coming up and using that mulch, incorporating it into the soil, and we get actually beneficial prod, um, soil conditions even the further away from the initial treatment that we do. So very interesting work, which is just going to be published soon, but we think this is a very useful, simple, I mean, intuitive way to re make the soil usable. When you can make the soil usable in terms of plant roots getting there, your plant selection choices will be much greater. The other area in terms of, we're getting to the whole idea of avoidance, plant avoidance, avoiding stress. How can you do things that are going to allow plants to avoid stress instead of tolerating them? And so the worst case scenario are, are there are street trees, this, this guy's going into this hole, and uh, very, very limited soil conditions. Uh, very difficult sites. This is where I really spend most of my work on. And um, so because of the purposeful compaction, it happens all over the place. In a city where you're going to be paving, any sort of paving, you have to purposely compact the subgrade and the soil so that you can have load bearing of your pavement. And in doing that purposeful compaction, not inadvertent through construction, but purposeful, we're actually reducing the availability of soil to plant roots. And here we have, um, well, where are these plants? We've, you've all seen trees that are in paved areas and they're enormous and you say, well, how are the trees getting what they need? And the answer is they're escaping. The roots are escaping to find soil elsewhere. And if they're not escaping, the tree often doesn't do very well for a long time. So here we are with our air spade. We've taken off a flag of concrete in um, downtown area in city. We want to see, and there's a big, big old Norway maples here on this, we call a tree lawn or green strip. There's no way this Norway maple could get all it needs from that green strip in the, near the sidewalk. So we wanted to know where the roots were. And here they are, okay? There's the Norway maple, there's, we took off the concrete, the uh, sidewalk, and the tree roots are just underneath that concrete, just in that area of weakness between the compacted soil and a little bit of aggregate or gravel base. When you have that little bit of weakness, a little bit of condensation under the concrete, roots can make their escape under the sidewalk and into somebody's front yard and into somebody's backyard and they're all the way there and they're getting what they need. So they're occupying a much larger volume than you might, might appear to be just by looking at the surface. 
also notice that the roots are very superficial. They're not down, which we say, typically we say roots grow down maximum about a meter. These are, you know, maybe uh, six, eight centimeters tops in terms of where they are. Because the soil is so compacted, roots cannot penetrate down deeper, and they just get out through this area of weakness between the sidewalk and the aggregate. And of course, in doing this, this is a big deal in the United States. We often get sidewalk heaving, which causes a lot of trip and fall damage, a lot of litigation, a lot of cost for municipalities, and so we try to avoid this fact as well. Uh, we see all kinds of, you know, stories. If you look around, you see the fact that in a, the most paved areas where you have a lot of concrete, asphalt, paving, plazas, this is the most restricted area for plants normally. Okay? So you see this, uh, it's amazing this tree got as big as it did, uh, but you see the shallow nature of the root zone and the fact that it just blew over. I think this picture kind of speaks for itself. So, I'm saying the lack of soil trumps trees. And what does that mean? Lack of soil trumps trees. It means when you have very poor soil conditions, I mean really restricted soil conditions like you see here, tree selection may not be a real big issue. I mean, so you really need to think about making the site available for plant roots as well as the plant selection part. So a lot of my work is on making the site better so we have a better diversity of plants that will do well and give us what we want when we choose that plant. So lack of soil trumps trees. This is a you know, classic picture of lack of soil, basically expressing the growth of these willow oaks, Quercus fellows, planted at the same time. This is in Washington, D.C. You know, this was a large volume of soil. This is a very small volume of soil. It's just showing you what the resources are available to that tree, and the tree grows accordingly. So we develop something called structural soil, so you structural soil. There are many structural soils. There's a Scandinavian, Swedish version, large cobbles. There are sand-based structural soils that are used in, in Germany. And there's a, a medium-sized one, which we use in the United States, which is about a crushed gravel of about three centimeters diameter, one size. Here's that crushed gravel. And if we use one size gravel and compress it, we get these large pore spaces in between, which we then fill with soil. And the soil is not compacted because if we do it right, the gravel touching each other from stone to stone to stone, bearing the load of that compaction, yet the soil in between the stones is not compacted and roots just shoot through it. Does that make sense? Okay. So this is a, just a kind of a schematic to show you how it works. And this is the stone we happen to use when we're making it. It can be any stone as long as it's crushed to the right size and the right hardness. We add a heavy type of soil, a, clay, a lot of clay soil, clay loam to clay soil. So we're going to maximize the nutrient holding and water holding capacity of that soil. And I have to point out Jason Grabowski, my former student who he now cleaned up and a professor at Rutgers. Um, so he did much of this work, and I, you know, it's all through my students that all this happens. Um, and this is what it looks like. Doesn't look very horticultural, does it? Looks kind of stony, doesn't it? But if you do it right, you coat the stone with the clay, and then when it's compacted, uh, well, I'll show you what happens. This, I do these sidewalks to nowhere uh, very often in my research plots to, to have a long-term study of some of these uh, structural soils. And here we have uh, compacted clay loam, and some of these are structural soil. And we wanted to look at the root systems of these. And so here's our, uh, this is Norway maple, clonal Norway maple in structural soil sidewalks. We wrapped the edges so the roots couldn't escape. And then we can see the roots coming through the structural soil, just uh, very vigorous root growth. But we wanted to go further than that. So we took it some apart, we cut them down, took off the concrete, and with our air spade, we cleaned off an entire root system in one piece. This is a structural soil root system of Norway maple in one piece. And we were able to clean it off and take the whole thing out 
measure it, and study it. So this is a pretty good root penetration of that soil. And this is a control where we have the compacted soil here, and we just sort of planted the same size tree in that area, but no structural soil, just a little aggregate, as we would do in the United States as a base. And then we took that tree out, and that's what the tree root system looked like. In very superficial, like we saw on the sidewalk, not able to find much space to actually allow the tree to grow. And the tree above ground showed the results of that. So what we have here is the same size tree, same clone tree, planted in a structural soil, an area where roots could penetrate and find volume, versus one where our typical profile, which is compacted and a gravel base. So what we have here is an avoider. Basically, these trees on the left are finding more volume of soil and avoiding stress because if the roots can find more soil, they're gonna get more water and get more nutrients and avoid stress, which might be apparent because of the top part of the tree because of global warming and heat and so on that happens above ground. And this is a, what we might have here is if a tree cannot get out, cannot find more rooting space, it has to be a tolerator. It has to just sit there and take it and hopefully do well. Maybe some trees are able to do that. In fact, Henrik is going to talk about the tolerator type trees, where my work mostly deals with trying to avoid those stressful conditions uh, using a, an avoidance mechanism, which typically is a soil mechanism. Getting more soil avoids the stress. So we actually wanted to find out how much soil volume we needed. We did uh, work in, in a couple of years where we, we rolled up the grass, we cut the grass, the sod, rolled it up, and with an air spade, we uncovered root systems of intact trees that had been growing for many, many years. It happened to be red maple. And we, with an air spade, we cleaned that off. And we found the extent of the root system for an intact tree, the depth and the extent for different sized trees. And then we had prediction, we figured out there must be a relationship between the crown, the canopy, and the amount of soil that the roots are colonizing to support that crown. And uh, that's, the, that's the relationship. So here we have what we actually saw in cubic meters in terms of the root zone. This is what these trees were colonizing. We empirically saw this. And this is what we measured in terms of the crown volume of the leaf area of these trees. So there's a pretty good relationship between crown volume, you want to get a bigger tree, you need to have more soil. And we can come up with these relationships to size the soil volume before we even plant the tree to ensure that the tree is going to get to the size we intend it to. And we have structural soil now. We can put it under sidewalks. It's, many, it's used many places. There are many types of engineering solutions for finding more soil, avoiding stress. Some of it might be structural soil of the various different types. Some might be the cell type, uh, like silver cells or strata cells or blue-green, as I saw out there. There are all different solutions to trying to find more rooting space if you have to have compaction. And if you don't have to have compaction, that's the best solution whatsoever. Use good soil and don't compact it. But where you have to, it's really nice to know there are some technologies that are going to help you. This is uh, structural soil, trees and structural soil in, in Ithaca, growing quite well in a sidewalk situation. And so the important thing about the site is knowing what they are, and if you can find a way to find more rooting volume, you're going to be avoiding those stresses that are, might be there on the site. Function in the landscape, important. We have many different ecosystem services. We heard more and more about that today, and we all know about that. In fact, this is important. It's very, very important, especially stormwater mitigation in the United States has become a, a big issue in terms of requiring this kind of green infrastructure to mitigate some of our stormwater issues. Um, so these are important things that people want to have the trees with their big canopies to be able to provide these services. You, no big trees, basically you're not gonna get the function for which you planted it. And you can here see the sh effect of shade. We saw the infrared camera before in terms of how much temperature difference you can get with the shade of trees in a hot paved area. 
So that's, so we know, we're talking about adaptation to the site, function, design function, and then there's management concerns. And these are, can be significant, and there's a lot of them. And can you get the tree? Is it available? Cost? What size can you get it at? Some trees are tr have a difficulty in transplanting. I know that's a big issue we have to deal with. I'm doing research now and trying to figure out why some trees can transplant easier than others. We have issues of invasiveness. Now, this is a local thing. I don't think of it as a, as a global thing, but locally there can be invasive plants which we try to avoid because of uh, potential ecological harm in the natural landscape. Maintenance, you know, pruning, thorns, branching habit, need for a lot of maintenance is, important. is it something to think about, susceptibility to storm damage. Now, willow, willows, poplars in an urban environment typically are very, uh, have a lot of breakage. Very important to minimize the susceptibility to disease and insect. And that we saw, heard from Mike about, you know, that's a major issue for trees in the urban environment. Local regional concerns, important. And I leave at the bottom the need for biodiversity. The need for diversity, as we've heard from many speakers already, is uh, quite an important factor, a one way to mitigate or to hedge against those problems that are going to come down the road where we have a lot of the same monocultural species around. So we've seen a lot of pictures like this. This is um, Cornell University, famous clock tower, about, we figure, 1950s maybe here, uh, 40s, 50s before when we have huge American elms, very iconic uh, streets like this. And then probably, maybe this was like a 50s, 60s, all gone. Dutch elm disease, wiped them out. But our learning curves can be very flat, okay? So here we are again. Now we have London plane trees, all the same. And uh, there's the clock tower, still the clock tower, and it's still there. And all the same, all the same. We have a problem. I mean, we heard this morning about Baron Hausman and you know, what he did in terms of introducing trees in urban areas, but he has to answer for a lot uh, in terms of getting this aesthetic of uniform LAs, uniform LAs of the same species over and over again. And it became an aesthetic that people aspired to, and I understand that, it's a cultural issue, uh, but it causes problems because we end up with monocultures and lack of diversity, which we really need to think about. And we've seen these guys, too. Emerald ash borer, Asian longhorn beetle. These are pests that we deal with uh, currently. And here we have Worcester, Massachusetts, which is an outbreak of Asian longhorn beetle in this one little community in Massachusetts, probably brought by firewood that was delivered there. And this, like many, uh, Cities in, in the Northeast are predominantly maple, which is one of the favorite foods of Asian longhorn beetle, but it has a huge host range. So the before and the after is pretty striking. I mean, you have to think about what your need for diver or uniformity is doing in terms of what the susceptibility is for insects and diseases in the, in the future. So we really think that diversity is key. And there's so many great trees. There's so many great trees, some that we don't know very much about or you haven't had experience with, but there's a lot of people working on the diversity of huge number of trees that do very well in many different types of sites. So we need to think about that. In New York State, <laughs> and most of, we don't work in New Jersey, Pennsylvania, New York State, our st statewide uh, genera, 40, 44, 45% of all this urban trees, the street trees, in those states are maple, some type of maple. And we have 7% oak and 5% honey locust and about 4% linden. And this is, this is just not good. I mean, we're talking about a diversity of species that's very limited, very just ripe for being hit by some insect or disease that particularly likes one of these uh, genera. So we need to diversify, and it's possible to do this. There are huge numbers of trees here that will do well in various types of site conditions. So I call it tree pornography. You know you shouldn't do it, but you can't look away. 
we have to get away from this tree pornography, okay? So, but it's, it's, it is striking, right? It is these tree tunnels, it is striking. This is Bonn, Germany, cherries in a tree tunnel. And how do you like this one? South Africa, Jacaranda. I mean, it's, it's all over the place. It's not just Europe or US. It's, it seems to be a global phenomena. Tokyo, Ginkgo. Pretty striking, huh? But we're all smart people here. Isn't it possible to match species that look similar? That we could, if we, if we want this kind of symmetry, we could actually match species that are pretty similar, have the height to first branch the same? And we've done this in a limited way in Ithaca. We have three different species here. We weren't even trying in this case, but we have Zolkova and a couple of elms here, and they look very similar. And if we'd done a little bit more work with the branching up, they would be identical looking. So we can do these things if the need for symmetry is so powerful, we can do it in a better way. So we have more diversity. And I'm gonna finish up really thinking about, uh, there's still important things about uh, quality, plant quality. We, we have a phrase, uh, junk in, garbage in, garbage out. You need good quality plant material, well-grown, you know, so that you have really good confidence that the plants are gonna take off when you make that good selection of trees. And uh, most of the trees in the Northeast or Midwest in the United States are grown in the ground, not as we see here in beautiful barchams, where they're grown in the ground in soil and a tree spade takes them out uh, in, a, in a kind of cone, puts them in a basket, a burlap lined basket, and that's where most of the trees in, uh, in the United States actually are planted this way. And this is a tree yard in one of the big nurseries not too far in New York. So lots of trees going out, well grown, but there are issues in terms of transplanting, which I'm not gonna get into. Some do well, some don't do well, and that's another issue. If a tree doesn't transplant well, you've been hit a couple of times while it didn't make it, so you're not gonna plant that again. So you're gonna go with the easy transplanters the ones that always seem to do okay, at least initially, and that's gonna reduce your diversity. So we're working on the, some of those transplant problems to see why that is that a couple of, some species are just really difficult to get out of the roots and get into the ground. And that's an issue I've been involved with a long time. So limits of plant selection. Yes, you can choose those that are resistant to insects and diseases, and I really think you ought to think about that. You don't want to have to spray. You don't want to have to deal with major insect infestations if you don't have to. Size and shape, yes, we can choose the size canopy trees that we want. Heat and cold, yes. Poor drainage, yes, there are some trees that can tolerate poor drainage and we know about those. It's going to limit your plant palette, but it is possible to choose those plants that are, deal with poorly drained soils. Dry soils, yes, up to a point, at some point, you need water, right? Um, a colleague in my, uh, my own in, in uh, Arizona said, no water, no landscape. So you need to think about that. pH, yes. Knowing the pH of the soil is important in terms of nutrient availability. Soil compaction, limited soil volume, maybe. Maybe, maybe we can find trees, and Henrik is gonna talk about this, that tolerate limited soil volumes and still provide the function with which we plant them. But the other idea is, is avoiding that stress by engineering more soil volume. And doing that will give you a much larger potential palette of plants to, to select from. I just wanna finish up with uh, some work we're doing. For the last 25 years, I've been working on oaks. Oaks, I've been hybridizing and trying to propagate on their own roots many different oak species. And we can see here, these are two-year-old clones of some of the hybrids we've created at Cornell. And some very exciting ones, which we're now about, almost about to get ready. This is a, a Macrocarpa times Turbinella. And if you don't know what Turbinella, I didn't either. It's a Sonoran Desert Oak, which happens to be compatible in the same subgenus as our native bur oak, Macrocarpa. They would never have ranges that overlap, 
So we had our native trees and brought pollen from all over the world of those subgenera of oaks that would be compatible with the oaks that we had. And we made these amazing crosses trying to get more drought tolerance and alkaline soil tolerance. And so this is one of our uh, very exciting selections. It has almost like a holly-like leaf. It's exceptionally cold hardy, drought tolerant, and alkaline soil tolerant. So we're looking at some of these to uh, eventually get out to the nursery. Our bottleneck here is now getting them propagated fast enough to get them out and to get them disseminated to growers uh, around the country. But we're very excited about these new oaks that are coming down the street. It only takes 25, 30 years to get this going. And I leave with this last picture, almost, almost last picture, of uh, this is a Zuccotti Park. It's a the big plaza park right near the uh, city hall in Manhattan, in New York City. And these are Glidizia tricanthos, all of them. And underneath, in this very paved area, is entirely structural soil. Those trees are doing great. They have a huge volume of structural soil to accommodate them. And the Glidizia is a very drought tolerant tree that is able to use structural soil in a very good way. So not all trees do well in this, but here's one that does very well. So plant selection has to go along. Even if you get more volume, you have to think about the plant that will do well in that kind of uh, structural soil condition. So I leave you with my website because there's so much more information here that I would be, you know, urge you to have a look, play around, videos, free things to download, databases. Um, it's there for anybody to use. And I think at this point, we're ready to hear Henrik's side of the story. So I will give it to you. All right. You hear me? Yeah. All right. Yeah, there you go. Uh, well, I, I will continue then with uh, the field of um, plant selection or tree selection for uh, urban environment. And um, as uh, Nina just clearly showed, that site, site modification and plant selection should never be divided. It should always be together, always in the planning or in the selection process. But sometimes it's not possible, especially in inner city environment, in paved site and street environments. So it's not possible to create optimal growing condition, like unlimited rooting space and have a microclimate that fits the perfect for the plants. In these cases, it's important for the plant selection. It's crucial to select the plant that even if the plant, uh, site situation is not optimal, it's possible anyway to have a good plantation where the tree, trees develop well and perform well, but it comes to the selection of proper plant materials. And what I would like to uh, communicate through the first uh, part of my presentation is that we need to develop a better understanding or a greater understanding in a way when it comes to which kind of biological or ecological uh, perspective trees have de developed in order to grow and perform well in, uh, in different natural habitats. Because in nature, trees have developed stray uh, traits or strategies in order to compete for resources or survive in different kind of climates and or survive in some really, really extreme growing habitats. Uh, because I believe it's important, this is the, maybe a little bit plant geek for you guys, but it, it's time now that the plant geeks in you guys comes out. It's, 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 it's time now to come out from the closet and say, yes, I am a plant geek. I care about the details of plants. <laughs> there you go. Uh, so my, my presentation will clearly show that it's, it's important to talk about the details when it comes to plant selection, to al allow us to do that. But first, I will introduce you to a family member of mine. This is Samuel. He's 12 years old, and he does what he loves to do, play computer games. And his favorite game for the moment is called the Dragon Ball. And don't judge me, because the games is not about dragon and even their eventual balls. It's not about that. It's more about adventure. But sometimes, as a parent, you want to bond a little bit with 
with your children. And I, I sit down and ask him what the games was all about. I start to explain that, well, in order to be successful in the game, you have to develop skills, you have to develop strategies to win, and also you have to collect different kind of weapons in order to be successful. And in order to succeed to the next level, you have to develop even better skills, even better strategies, and collect even more weapons. And everything makes sense. But the scary thing, or the funny thing, is that the next week I have a lecture for the students in Alnarp in plant selection from urban environments. And I can hear myself saying more or less the same as Samuel said. Well, in order to be successful in your plant selection, you have to choose plants that are equipped with the right strategies, even the right weapons to survive and perform well. And if you should qualify to the next level, for example, street environments, you have to have even better skills, even better strategies, and the weapon should be even, even better. And that's actually true, because plant selection and computer, ga computer games maybe have some similarities, because there is trees <laughs> that have more or less superpowers, almost, but they are very, very tough. They have developed different kind of skills to survive or can compete in some really challenging uh, environment. And it's important to know which kind of trees these are. But it's equally important to know <laughs> which are the trees that doesn't have that. <laughs> maybe they have traits, but they're not maybe that developed or m much more limited. So we don't force them into situations they have no idea to handle. Because when it comes to urban environment, you can't say urban trees and say that's a general thing. Because urban environment includes enormous amount of different growing habitats. And I would like to give, this is Stockholm by the way, the center of Stockholm in the middle of summer. And here you can see you have street courtyard, they have parks, all these are urban habitats. But they represent different kind of growing habitats or growing condition. So I would like to, to present some kind of checklist, how you can think or how you should work when it comes to plant selection, which probably helped you a little bit better to, to discover which trees that you should not use for your project or the trees that you should use because they have the potential. And I follow the, the, the stuff that Nina already have a little bit went through. You have to start with an analyze of the site to see what kind of limitation does the site represent. For example, the quality of the soil, the microclimate, the space both below, below, uh, below and above ground. Is the site uh, exposed to salt in the winter time? But also, what kind of benefits does the site have? In Sweden, we actually, this is a little bit stupid probably to say in front of you, but we actually sometimes, we like urban heat island effect. <laughs> because suddenly, we get warmer microclimate in the inner city environment, and suddenly, a lot of trees grow better because they get warmer temperature, but also longer growing season. So that could actually be benefits. But when you include all this in your site analyze, the next step is to try to identify what kind of traits or strategies are necessary for the trees to be equipped with in order to perform well, grow well on